Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. We, uh, we're going to have a, a, a beginning portion of the, of the meeting today, which is a ritual that we do at DAR. And then if you all have a program, did you all get a copy of the American's Creed? You can all join us in saying that. I'd like to have you join us in, by standing for the DAR ritual. To perpetuate the memory and the spirit of the men and women who achieved American independence, to promote the development of an enlightened public opinion and to foster patriotic citizenship. These are the objects of our society, daughters of the American Revolution. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy guidance and for Thy abiding presence in the life of our country. We thank Thee and all of those yesterdays of our human race whose lessons and fulfillments have become a heritage to us. Continue, we pray, Thy blessings upon this nation, that all who are part of it may learn true nobility of manhood and womanhood. Grant us growth in understanding and increasing devotion to righteousness. In Thy name we pray. Amen. Would you all join me in the Pledge to Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like you to join us now in saying the American's Creed. I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, by the people, for the people, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed, a democracy and a republic, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states, a perfect union, one and inseparable, established upon whose principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity for which American patriots sacrificed their lives and fortunes. I therefore believe it is my duty to my country to love it and to support its constitution, to obey its laws, to respect its flag, and to defend it against all enemies. Normally we have, you may please be seated. Thank you. Normally we have a, we say these rituals at every meeting, and we usually have a treasurer's report in a September, but the, from our September meeting, but we're going to postpone that until our November meeting. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to thank Scott McMillan for offering us to use this hall. We really appreciate it. It's a beautiful building, and he'll be speaking a little bit later on about the hall, so we'll get a little bit of history about that. I'd like to welcome you all to this event. The National Society of the DAR encourages state and local chapters to hold commemorative events cited by the National Society that promote both education and patriotism. 100 years ago, the United States of America entered World War I. Although President Woodrow Wilson's administration maintained a neutral stance during the early years of the conflict, Germany's increased ing aggression toward the U.S. resulted in America declaring war on April 6, 1917. Our society is a partner with the World War I Centennial Commission, and we have been reflecting on this centennial event in many different ways. The Colonel Thomas Lothrop Old Colony Chapter members agreed that we wanted to hold this event to learn more about World War I and to honor the veterans that served. Jessica DeLott will introduce our guest speaker, so she come forward. 
Okay, so today we have guest speaker Joe Malarney. I'm going to give a little bit of his bio so you understand his background. Joe Malarney is an application sales executive at Oracle Corporation, selling cloud services to small and medium-sized businesses. Prior to Oracle, Joe worked as a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley in Dallas, Texas. He taught history and government as a high school teacher in Newton and worked in Washington, D.C. for a nonprofit and in the U.S. Senate. He received his bachelor's degree from Trinity College of Hartford and majored in political science and history, specializing in American political and military history. While at Trinity, Joe was also a member of the varsity rowing team. He went on to receive his master's in history from Yale University, in which he focused on Cold War American culture, politics, and foreign policy. In his previous role as a teacher, Joe traveled extensively to China and Southeast Asia. Joe remains an active member of both his high school and college, serving as a member of the Brooks School Alumni Board and Friends of Trinity Rowing Boathouse Group. He continues to self-educate through his hobbies of reading novels and biographies and listening to podcasts. Comes to us today from Andover, Massachusetts, so please welcome Joe Malarney. Thank you, uh, Jess, for the introduction, and Suzanne for having me here, and thank you to everyone else for attending. Um, this is a really beautiful hall, and I feel um, uh, very appreciative for having um, been invited to speak with you. Um, a, a little personal history, though. Uh, on my mother's side of the family, we've had uh, an uncle who was a Marine, another uncle who was in the Navy, and um, my late grandfather, who passed away last year, was uh, uh, Green Beret and served. Uh, he enlisted when he was 16, um, lied about it, got his mom to sign the notice, and was in Korea. And his claim to fame there was that he actually saw MacArthur, General MacArthur, drive by on a Jeep. So I don't know if that's true, but he always told me that he saw him there, so I believed him. I uh, did two tours in Vietnam and also um, served in the mission to capture Che Guevara in the jungles of Bolivia. So, very honorable and courageous man and a hero of mine. So, there, I have a deep respect for our military and our country and its history. Um, do you have my phone, Jess? I want to just start this off, though, with um, something that stood out to me when I first got on the Yale campus, and it was um, on a cenotaph that stands outside um, a memorial hall there, and on it is written, in memory of the men at Yale, who true to their traditions gave their lives that freedom might not perish from the earth. 1914, Anno Domini, 1918. So as soon as you go on Yale's campus, there's a strong history of American involvement in World War I, and below that motto is the battles that were, that men from Yale fought in. And um, so, I guess what I wanted to talk a little bit about today was the war, how it started, how it evolved, how it changed, why America got involved, and also to the results and consequences of it that we still live with today. So I also want to make this interactive as well. If anyone wants to ask questions or interject or, you know, if I'm saying something and you have a question or maybe I'm wrong, then feel free to <laughs> chime in. Um, I want to make this an open forum. So, when I think the popular notions we have about World War I is trench warfare, um, barbed wire, poisonous gas. Um, I think one of the stirring uh, legacy that's left with us is lines being, being led by donkeys. So these brave young men being led to battle by these generals who aren't really considerate of their needs and just see them as throwing them in the meat grinder. Um, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, so when the war does break out in 1914, what is so um, complex and intriguing about it is that prior to that, many people, um, statesmen, political theorists, diplomats, didn't really think that something as catastrophic as that was going to happen. A giant war that would kill 15 million people, injure 20 million. So we're left with the question, why did it happen? Why in such a peaceful time of world trade, prosperity, peace, did something as catastrophic as this break out? And adding on to that was the fact that the Tsar of Russia, the Kaiser of Germany, and the King of England were all first cousins. 
they all refer to themselves to each other by their first names, um, cousin Nikki and Russia, and so why then, when countries were so closely related, why then did they choose to go to war with each other? And I think the problem that arose with this was, although they were so closely related, they also too had these deep-seated animosities towards each other, much like today, you know, families fight, or not every family gets along, but the decisions that were being made were being made by very few um, people. So these heads of states, there were secret treaties that were being organized, there were interests that they thought were not being met, in particular the Kaiser of Germany, ruled as a pretty iron-fisted autocrat, um, and was very jealous of the British Empire and thought he didn't get the respect that he deserved from his cousins. So in um, the summer of 1914, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary is in the, the city of Sarajevo, um, Bosnia. He's shot by an assassin, and as a result of that, the treaties that had gone on that weren't really well known to all the partners within Germany, the major powers, start to combine and mobilization happens and you have Germany declaring war on Russia, who then declares war on Germany, and then France declares war on Germany, and then Britain declares war on Germany. So you have really the dominoes begin to fall, countries start attacking each other. And in the beginning of 1914, you have a just systematic slaughter on the battlefield. Um, prior until 1914, there had been a major war in Europe for a hundred years. You had to go back to the Napoleonic Wars that ended in 1815 to really have a conflagration like this. So going into the war, and I think what makes it the most interesting, but also the most tragic, is that when these powers go to war, they're fighting it using 19th century tactics. So there are no trenches yet, there's no real use of barbed wire. There's no real poison gas. There's nothing like that. Instead, it's fought with men charging each other on open fields, and the results are just devastating. And so in that first few months of war, when they finally break out in August, you just have tens, hundreds of thousands of young men being killed. And I think it's probably most um, encapsulated by in late August, a French offensive against the Germans results in 30,000 dead Frenchmen in one day. So 30,000 dead in one day. Um, in the United States, I think the worst casualty from battle is Antietam in the Civil War. And that's three or 4,000, I could be wrong, but it's, it's a couple thousand. And this is 30,000 dead, not even the amount injured or wounded. So the war then, continues for several more years. There's stalemate, no country can get an upper hand on it. During this time, America has remained neutral. Woodrow Wilson, who won in um, 1912 under a divided Republican Party, he meets Theodore Roosevelt and uh, the incumbent president, William Howard Taft. He's president, he says the United States is gonna remain neutral. It's not gonna get involved in the conflict. He went on 1916 saying he kept us out of the war, beats Charles Evans Hughes. However, Germany is continuing its policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. So innocent boats are being bombed. Uh, most famously in 1915, the sinking of the Lusitania, a British cru cruise liner kills 128 Americans. The government in America says, what are you doing here? They're killing innocent civilians. The German says, we have a blockade. We can't do anything. We need this unrestricted submarine warfare. They come to a peaceful agreement to not allow for unrestricted submarine warfare for two years. Germany then breaks that in 1917 and also sends a telegraph to the government in Mexico saying, if you help us against the United States, we'll give you back the territories you lost in the Mexican-American War. So if Germany wins, it will give Mexico back Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California. The Americans find out about this and say, okay, enough's enough, we can't do this any longer. And so we declare war on Germany in April 1917. And we do this in a way to not only protect our own self-interests, but also to, to protect 
the democracies of Europe, who at this time are fighting a German autocrat who is trying to take away systems of government, the parliament in England, um, the French Republic, uh, countries that have had long traditions of democracy. And so we see it at, in a way, and at the time, that America is trying to protect the same values that we have, that these other countries have in Europe. And so in April 1917, we declare war. There isn't really much American involvement, however, until a year later when we start sending 10,000 soldiers a day over to France. Um, it, if you think about it, it, it makes sense though for the time back then there was the modes of communication and um, technology wouldn't allow for such a rapid mobilization considering the fact that the last major American war was ended in 1865. So the American Civil War is the last major war. It's now been 50 years. And most of the American army is really just responsible for um, fighting Native Americans and pushing papers. It's not a very big army. I think at the time, uh, even a country like uh, Bulgaria has an army much larger than ours. So when they do start coming over, the Americans land and are led by um, John Pershing, John Blackjack Pershing. He's uh, an American general who's famous for chasing Pancho Villa into Mexico and also for um, helping suppress the insurrection in the Philippines, which the United States controlled at the time. Um, and when they first get over there, they say, we're not gonna have any French or British generals command our troops, it's just American commanders. We're gonna do what we want. We're not gonna allow our soldiers to be, because um, at the time there was this popular notion that the French and British commanders were just um, meat grinders. They just threw the troops in, see what happens, and we had such respect for our soldiers and the public at home that was still getting into supporting the war that we didn't want to see tens of thousands of our soldiers killed for no reason, for no purpose. So when we first got over there, soldiers go right in and they're actually a uh, German commander. I thought it was funny when I was uh, doing some research for this, describe American soldiers as um, suicidally brave, uh, good marksmen, but poorly led. So the commanders at the time, justifiably so, weren't up to the same standards that the Europeans were who had been fighting this kind of war for four years. So as soon as the American soldiers are sent in, they think it's um, Teddy Roosevelt at San Juan Hill in the Spanish-American War. They're just charging and um, they're they are very, as American soldiers are, very brave, but um, almost to a fault. They don't really have regard for their own lives. They want to win the battle by themselves. And uh, so at first, the major fight in the US soldiers see is outside of Paris. And the Germans are launching another attack to take Paris and the war before the Americans can become too strong. They fail largely because of American reinforcements who managed to turn them back. And throughout the fighting, they lose, they start to suffer the same amount of casualties that the British and French, Germans and Russians had. And luckily our involvement wasn't too long. The war ends in November, but between the major fighting of the US in there from April 1918 to November 1918, the suffering and casualties are extremely high. Um, the Battle of um, the Aragon Meuse, which are rivers in northern France, um, is actually the bloodiest battle in American history. They lose, over the course of two months, over 26,000 men. And so, during this time, though, you have extreme um, displays of, cur of courage by American soldiers and commanders. Um, one of the most famous one is by this um, mostly by Marines, not to show any preference, but the Marines uh, make a name for themselves in a battle called Belle Wood in Northeast France. And uh, one of the generals there, or one of the sergeant majors named Dan Daly, who prior to coming over and fighting World War I had actually won two Medal of Honors already. And so at the Battle of Belle Wood, um, his troops are caught down in machine gun fire, 
and nobody's moving, and he gets up and yells um, something along the lines of, I don't want to curse, but it says, come on, you SOBs, you want to live forever. Charges up, takes the hill, and uh, is then recommended for a third Medal of Honor, and they say, we can't do that. So he's given other awards and medals, but um, another act is by uh, Alvin York, who at the same offensive manages to kill, who, funny enough, much in the ways of the, the, you know, how American history is complicated, he begins the war as a conscientious objector. So he doesn't even want to fight, doesn't believe in violence. Anyway, he gets drafted, he goes over, and almost single-handedly kills 20 Germans and captures 132. Becomes an international, or national star in America, but international star, and um, receives the Medal of Honor, and is one of the most famous Americans to emerge from the war. Um, and so, as a result of the American involvement, the war is able to end more quickly, with less casualties than would have been, and with a better bargaining chip for the Americans and their allies at the end at Versailles, which, coming up a year from November, will be 100 years. So 100 years since the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and at Versailles, what gets more complicated as well is the fact that the Germans don't unconditionally surrender. They just say, we agree to an armistice, we're gonna stop fighting, but we don't want to be treated like you beat us. And so going into Versailles, President Woodrow Wilson comes in and has these ideas that we're going to create a League of Nations, there's never going to be a major war like this again, we're going to, countries are going to become liberal, democratic, um, capitalist societies, and none of us will ever fight each other. And uh, I was telling Jess about this earlier, in, uh, there's an interesting, um, in political thought, Machiavelli says that when you see an enemy of yours drowning, you either need to do two things. Help them out and save them, or push their head under and drown them. Don't let them keep drowning. Because if they get out, they're going to remember what you did. If you did nothing, they're going to seek revenge. And so, Wilson comes over with his 14 points, says we should help Germany out, make them become a liberal democracy, Read them back into the um, you know, international relations, establish trade, and the French who have lost millions of young men say, no way, we're not gonna allow this to happen, we're gonna break Germany up, destroy it as a country, take away its land, pass these severe reparations, make them a third world country. And then Britain's in the middle and says, well, we can do both. We'll kind of humiliate them and take away their land, reduce their army, but we'll also to try to establish trade with them and make them part of our community again. And so as a result, I think we all, or most of us probably know what happens at Versailles. The Germans feel they're stabbed in the back, they're humiliated, and as a result, um, at the end of Versailles, um, the French leader who ended up commanding all the Allied troops, the Americans finally gave in and said, okay, these European generals know a lot more than us about how to fight these wars now, we can't just charge in. We need to establish some good tactics. He says that um, Versailles isn't a peace, it's a 20 year truce. And as he said that, almost 20 years to the day, the German Wehrmacht invaded Poland and started World War II. So as a result, the United States doesn't, for reasons at the time made sense, doesn't ratify the League of Nations that comes out of that. There is no, America at the time, I think its eyes are bigger than its stomach. It's a world power. Um, it could yield significant amounts of it, but decides to go back to isolationism and not to get involved in the world affairs. In particular, they didn't want to join the League because they didn't want to protect the empires of Britain and France. They thought this League was going to be set up. Britain and France have these huge empires, and our American boys are just going to be sent there to protect these isolated areas around the world, in Asia and the Middle East, and we don't want any part of that. So, as a result, 20 years later, American soldiers eventually have to go into Europe again to um, save them from tyranny. So, in a summation, I guess, uh, although America's involvement in World War I was somewhat brief and um, less deadly as it was for other nations involved, they really did tip the scale and allow for a better end of it to come than what would have um, had the Germans won 
Um, and they did have plans to occupy Belgium, occupy France, occupy Ukraine. Um, they had a, a model to really establish a German empire, an autocratic empire all across Europe. And because of that, the United States, with the help of its allies, was able to stop that, or at least delay it for another 20 years. So with that, if anyone has any questions or any points, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, so they were restricted in how many planes they could have. They were only allowed 200,000 soldiers in the army. Everything down to how many tanks was severely restricted. And how Germany got around that was Hitler basically just started increasing it and nobody said anything. He started openly defying the Treaty of Versailles, but because of the time, France was too weak to respond. Britain as well, and America just said, we don't want to get involved in this. They were allowed to just. So the regulations were in place to shift base and all that. Yes. Okay. Yep. I have a question. Sure. Uh, who was the uh, country that introduced the use of mustard gas? And how was that impact felt uh, during the war? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think there, there is some. Um, uh, controversy around that because it was um, for a while believed that it was the Germans that did it against actually a, um, a West African um, army group on the Western Front that were fighting for the French um, in around 1915 I believe but there uh, it's emerged that there it might have been used as early as 1914 on the Eastern Front the Germans against the Russians. So what we commonly think of with World War I is the trench warfare in northeast France and terrible fighting, but in the east what would come to be what would come to that a lot of what the fighting happened in the Eastern Front of World War I actually was closer to what would happen in World War II. So Eastern Front World War I, you had systematic killing of Jews, um, other nationalities, mustard gas, really a kind of ethnic cleansing war. And it was terrible, but it didn't really, because it was bad at that time, Russia was a very, very poor country. Not a lot of great communication. They still were, at the time, most of the Russian officers would be um, drunk during campaigns. Get my voice now. And so, when the Russians actually, too, were trying to communicate to their soldiers on the Eastern Front, they had their giant, um, megaphones and they would openly just give the orders without any kind of coding or anything else like the Russian military was pretty dreadful and terrible they end up Russia ended up losing four million um, military civilians in World War one and they were only in the war for about three years so you could see why as a result of the war as well the Bolshevik Revolution happens in uh, the fall of 1917 so as the Americans get in the Russian the biggest country with the biggest military is getting out. So that really created a, a huge problem for the Allies. And Germany, who had been, had maybe won the war early in 1914, came just as close again to winning in early 1918. So if America hadn't gotten involved, Germany probably would have won. Although it's generally thought, oh, you know, the Allies had it under control, the Americans came in late. Had the Americans not been there, Germany most likely would have won. Becky Bates, it's a song. Can you hear me? No. That's great. Becky, Becky Bates MacArthur is going to come up and talk briefly about Cohasset's involvement and their World War I veterans. Thank you. 
Turkey. Maybe speaking loud. This is all. I'm going to bring the story of the war back home to this area. Um, in 1917, before then, Company K of the 5th Regiment of the Massachusetts National Guard, which was an offshoot of the volunteer militia, had weekly drills here in Hingham at the new armory. On July 29, 1917, they were called to active duty. And when they left Cohasset, when the men left Cohasset, they all were given badges that they were from Cohasset. Um, back then, a company served together. They were from the same town, so the whole company would go somewhere. So it wasn't that you would have people from all over the um, country in a unit. It would be people from certain areas. The um, 37th Company of the Massachusetts State Guard mustered and trained to fill the duties that the National Guard had been doing. And the um, National Guard was um, eventually sent to France. The Home Front established a public safety committee and the state funds were low for equipment for these fellows to go overseas and the town put on a vaudeville program so they could buy equipment. And as I read the history of Cohasset, lots of activities were held to help supply the men when they went off to service. The 5th and the 9th Massachusetts regiments were formed to form the 101st Infantry of the Yankee Division. And I'm sure we've all heard of the Yankee Division, which was the, from the state. The commanding officer was Colonel Edward Logan. And if people from Cohasset, this area, might remember the Logan estate, we call the Ridges. He, his family bought property on Jerusalem Road, and um, he lived there after the war. And he's the, he's, um, Logan Airport was named after him as a local hero. hero. And just another point, um, Margaret Hall, who was a Red Cross nurse that actually lived in Hull, um, went over to, to Europe as a nurse and she snuck a camera into her baggage. And in Cohasset, we have quite a collection of pictures that she took of all over France when she was a nurse. I mean, dead bodies, crosses, lots of interesting pictures there. The Yankee Division was the first American division to face the army as a unit, face the enemy as a unit. They arrived in France on September 20th, 1917, and they trained with the French. They took over command of the Chemie de Dames sector in April 1918, and they joined in the great Chateau Thierry battle. And at, at that time, three Cohasset men lost their lives. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit more about them later. And that was in April of 1918, and three men died within a month of each other from Cohasset. The Yankee Division was also involved with the Muse Argonne offense. And two men from Cohasset that lost their lives in, those ba in that battle, and they um, died within a week of each other. And the return, um, the first two men from Cohasset that were killed are buried at Bellow Woods in France. A third one was buried in France and his body was, body was brought back, I think, in the 30s. The returning veterans organized the American Legion Post in Cohasset. And in January of 1920, they had 134 members. And the Legion was very active in town activities in the 20s and 30s. And Memorial Day in Cohasset has a, has a uh, new meaning. And mainly I think it's because of the men that started it. We don't have a parade 4th of July. We have a week's activities on the, during Memorial Day honoring the men that died. In 1935, the American Legion traveled to Bellow Woods in France to lay wreaths on the graves of the um, two men that are buried in France. So that's a little bit about 
to has its involvement with the war. So in, in follow-up, I thought what we would do is we would read the names of the veterans that died in service that were killed in action during World War I. Becky is going to read the Cohasset names, and Carolyn Nutt said she would come up and read the names. There were 12 people from the town of Hingham that died. We had 270 people that served in World War I during, during the time that they were there. But 12 people died, so I'll let Becky read the name, and then the Carolyn will read it. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Do you have your list of names? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just show you. All right. We had Sergeant George Mealy, who died um, on July 17, 1918, and he is buried in France, and the American Legion Post in Cohasset is named after him. We had Corporal Lawrence B. Williams, who died July 19th in 1918, and he is also buried in France. We had Private John W. Sidney, who died August 17th. Um, we had Private Herman Daly, died October 14th, 1918, and his body was brought back later. And Private Joseph Gonzalez, who died in action on um, October 6th, 1918. The Hingham uh, veterans, uh, I'm just going to give a list of names. We don't have where they died. So it's Harold C. Barrett, Alexander H. Borland, Ernest Campbell, William F. Cavanaugh, Edward B. Cole, Walter L. Cross, uh, Edward Cole, it does say, was killed in action, Distinguished Service Cross and Navy Cross, World War I. Walter L. Cross, M. Everett DeLore, Maurice A. Linehan, Edmund H. Magner, James A. Parker, Coit S. Rogers, and Albert A. Ross. And that's the list of the Hingham veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Scott McMillan is going to come up now and give us a little bit of background and history on this building that is here to uh, honor the people that have served. And I will turn the microphone over to him. And then I'll have closing remarks after that. I'd just like to say that uh, Edward Ball Cole is the name of the American Legion post here in Hingham. Um, like I say, he was killed in uh, World War I. His picture is up on the wall uh, right over there to the right of the staircase. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, this building is called the GAR Hall. Uh, GAR is the Grand Army of the Republic. They are the uh, veterans of the Civil War, and they um, came back to Hingham and decided they needed a place to meet, so they actually built this hall, and they completed it in 1888. And um, a lot of the pictures that you see on the wall here um, were in the building since then. A lot of them are Civil War related. Um, we've had them all basically archivally restored um, over the past few years and um, we've been adding stuff as, as we go along. So you can see in the hall is um, we have quite a few mannequins. These are all Hingham people um, that, you, that you see the uniforms um, dating back to World War I. We do have a Civil War uh, reenactment uniform up there and also the one to the left of the Civil War is, is Benjamin Lincoln's uh, Revolutionary War uh, uniform. That's a replica also. Uh, we just received that uh, recently. Also, you see the cross up here on the um, uh, mid-stage there. It um, was donated by the Orlando family. Um, their son was killed a year ago in a uh, helicopter crash off the coast of Hawaii. We just did a big service in Hull uh, last week. Uh, they dedicated a bench in his honor. 
uh, down there. So we had a good group. Um, if anyone has any questions about the hall itself, um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. You can take a walk around and um, check it out. Uh, the GAR was a major factor in uh, politics, you know, right after World War, um, Civil War, excuse me. Um, you can see some of the pictures up on the top here. They had what they called an encampment uh, once a year where everybody got together from the Civil War and they had uh, large groups of people go to different states. And there's a picture up here um, of one they had in Boston. I think it's in 1904. And there's a large group of um, political uh, people in that. So um, take a walk around. If you have any questions, um, you can uh, give me a shout. If I have an answer, I'll be glad to get it to you. I'm not sure exactly how many. There were about 200 in Massachusetts back in the day. And, and I think there's about 10 left now. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of lucky that, um, you know, Hingham kind of stepped up. And uh, a lot of people wanted to tear it down. And, uh, you know, we had a, a little, bit, little bit of push to get it, you know, to save it. So we're kind of glad we did. But the, um, the, the last two members of the, uh, the GAR, uh, there's, a, there's a note up here um, somewhere, I'm not exactly sure where it is. Um, when there were only two left, they decided that they would donate it to the town of Hingham with stipulations to be used for uh, veterans um, meeting, meeting halls. So, any other questions? Is that been its role? There's been other things take on, you know, there's, there's been a dance studio here at times. There's been, uh, there was a sportsman club used to meet here. Um, I know the, uh, the Legion and the VFW used to meet in the basement before we had the uh, place renovated. You know, we were, we were kind of stuck down in the, down in the halls of the, uh, the basement down there. And this was used for basically a storage area up on the first floor. Uh, but up behind you was a, um, there's a, there's a, a room up top there. It's called the Governor's Box. And uh, that used to open up uh, back in the day and they could watch um, you can watch people on the stage, you know, they do shows and stuff here. Um, you know, so that's uh, been, been sheetrocked over, but the room is still up there and it's pretty, pretty neat up there. And the doors are still up on the inside. Uh, so yeah, Governor Long and Governor Andrew probably sat up there. And we have pictures of, um, you know, Governor Long in the back and uh, supposedly the flag in the corner over there, the, there's a four-star flag in the corner. Uh, that's. Um, he was the Secretary of the Navy, and we believe that was his flag. The, the other flags that you see up over the, uh, on the walls were found under the stage here um, during the renovation time. We had to clean everything out of the hall during the renovation, and we found those uh, under the stage, all the GAR comrade flags, and we had those all um, archivally restored and, and framed. Um, the one in the middle is a GAR symbol, yes. And all of those, there's a there's a little um, there's a little form right here on the side that gives you a gives you an exact uh, what they are. They're all different um, army, you know, part of the navy, part of the army. Some of them are artillery, but it tells you exactly what each one of them is on the uh, on that flag. And what they say they used to have um, these encampments uh, once a year and. Uh, we used to go around and, you know, they'd go around with all these flags and have them all, all around all over the place. And uh, there's a couple of other flags in the back. You see the big, huge, huge one in the cabinet back there. That's uh, called a centennial flag. That's from uh, 1876. I think there's 34 stars on there. I'm not sure. Um, the one in the middle is what we call a blue star banner. Um, the Blue Star Banner took off after World War I and uh, they used to hang it in the door and the windows of parents of uh, people serving in the military. So it used to be just a Blue Star with, you know, a, a flag with the red around the outside, the white, and usually one, two, or three stars denoting how many um, people you had serving in the uh, armed forces at the time. We think that one is uh, either from a church, possibly, um, that had, you know, parishioners uh, all serving. But it's taken off again. We, we, um, matter of fact, the American Legion has a, a little thing going now where we, we present a Blue Star banner um, to the families now. 
that, that have people serving in the military. So we go around and, uh, and present them with a blue star band or a certificate and a few other decals that they can put in the window of the car. Any other uh, questions? It's kind of a neat hall. You can see uh, up on the side here, uh, around the, this is all embossed leather that was um, put in at the time. And there's, uh, I don't know if you can see them or not, but there's, vent, there's vents up in the top corners and there's also vents in the bottom here. I guess they used to have like a wood burning furnace or something in here and uh, that's how they used to heat the place. But I guess they used to cool it too at, at uh, times. There's also a, uh, on the stage here at the bottom, you can see there's a little handle and there's an actually a drawer that kind of pulls out so they had another little small stage in the front. And on this top rail, there used to be um, a ton of like candles. They used to light up the, uh, the whole stage with candles. Um, during the renovation, they took all that stuff out. Uh, other than that, uh, if you guys want to walk around, or if you've got any more questions, I'll see if we can answer those. Thank you, Scott. In closing, I would like to publicly thank Lincoln Street Starbucks and Stop and Shop for providing coffee and refreshments, as well as all the members in our chapter that baked and have supported this commemorative event. And then, of course, a special thank you to Scott and the Board of directors here at the GAR Hall. More than four million American families sent their sons and daughters to serve in uniform during the Great War. 100,116, I'm sorry, 116,516 U.S. soldiers gave their lives in combat. Another 200,000 were wounded, a casualty rate that is far greater than in World War II. This commemorative event has provided us with an opportunity to give recognition to the American men and women who served during World War I. Thank you for attending today. We're glad you are here and you're invited to join us for refreshments afterwards.